Hey, so what do you think about when I say military innovation? Big gleaming American jets? Massive Chinese missiles? Probably not a 15th century Indian king sitting in a perfumed court. You might think that India has always been sitting around waiting for technology to trickle in from the rest of the world, but nothing could be further from the truth. From as early as the 15th century, before Europeans even knew about direct sea routes to India, the battlefields and forts of the subcontinent resounded with the boom of gunpowder. Indian rulers proactively hired specialists from across the world, and Indian weapons were sought after in the rest of the world. I am Anirudh Kanesetti, historian and author of Lords of the Deccan. Welcome to Thinking Medieval, where every week we tell you something new about our complex, innovative past. Always feel free to check out our research and citations and join us in figuring out how to think about our messy, bloody, dazzling history. South India in the mid-14th century was in flux after the Delhi Sultanate's incursions a few decades ago, on which more here. Powerful, innovative new states were emerging, including the Bahmani Sultanate and Vijayanagara. Vijayanagara, learning from the Bahmanis and their Delhi predecessors, poured enormous resources into dominating the battlefield with cavalry. That was a tried and tested tactic, and that was what had allowed earlier South Indian kingdoms, as well as Delhi, to thrive militarily. But Vijayanagara was way more successful in using its economic muscle to monopolize the seaborne trade in horses. Portuguese visitors and other contemporary chroniclers tell us that the kings of Vijayanagara also hired Turkic mercenary cavalrymen with deadly composite bows. Scholar Srinivas Reddy, translator of the Amukta Malyada of Krishnadevaraya, has also shown that the empire maintained a corps of Indian cavalrymen armoured in steel, riding towering Persian steeds. So, Vijayanagara now had huge armies of cavalry, but other parts of the world were accustomed to defending against them, especially in Persia, where their horses came from. And so, Vijayanagara's rival, the Bahmani Sultanate and its successor states, the Deccan Sultanates, imported fort designs from Persia, making impregnable fortifications studded with artillery. In Warfare on the Deccan Plateau, 1450-1600, Historians Richard Eaton and Philip Wagoner have shown that by 1460, Bahmani fortresses were being designed with polygonal bastions, bristling with small cannons. Larger siege guns were also being developed. In 1510, when the Portuguese attempted to conquer Goa from the Bijapur Sultanate, they were bombarded by Indian cannons on the shore. After finally seizing what is now Old Goa, they found a huge arsenal of gunpowder weapons. In it were Indian-made pieces, as well as samples from Mamluk Egypt and Ottoman Turkey. There were even a few Portuguese weapons that the Bijapuris had captured from them in 1508 to 1509. The Portuguese were very impressed. In 1513, Portuguese Viceroy Afonso de Albuquerque sent a Bijapuri gunsmith home to King Manuel I, with a letter declaring that the Bijapuris were producing better guns than master European gunsmiths. But even with all these innovations, the Vijayanagari warhorse still dominated the battlefield. At the Battle of Raichur in 1520, the Vijayanagara Emperor Krishnaraya used his highly mobile cavalry to annihilate the army of Ismail Adil Shah of Bijapur. The Bijapuri cannons took so long to reload that the Vijayanagara cavalry were able to close the distance easily. And after driving away Ismail Shah, Krishna Rai attacked the citadel of Raichur using Portuguese snipers with muskets to weaken the citadel before sending waves of pickaxe-wielding Indian infantry to break down the walls. The fort's cannons could not be angled to fire at attackers at close range, and so it was conquered. Now, from the perspective of the Vijayanagara strategist, it still seemed that it was the age of the warhorse, even if gunpowder had some limited uses. Fresh of these successes, Vijayanagara grew more and more aggressive through the 16th century. The Deccan Sultanates backed into a corner through their resources into military innovation. The Ahmadnagar Sultanate recruited Turkish masters to produce cast bronze cannons. Bijapur produced cannons of wrought iron, made of staves of metal held together with loops. Their bastions were re-engineered to carry heavier artillery, and they even pioneered the use of height-adjusting screws and swivel forks on bastions. 
These allowed mounted cannons to be rotated and angled up and down, something that even European cannons couldn't do at the time. But Vijayanagara still remained the dominant part of the Deccan until the Battle of Talikota on January 23, 1565, where it faced a coalition of four sultanates. Vijayanagara had tremendous numbers of matchlocks, light cannons and rockets at the battle. 50,000 are supposed to have been fired off as it started, terrifying the sultanate cavalry. But this emphasis on the enemy's horses means that Vijayanagara still imagined that victory would be won on horseback. But the Sultanate's artillery had developed considerably since the disastrous Battle of Raichur in 1520. The center of their line was a moving fortress, cannon mounted on wagons and packed with bronze coins that exploded outwards as shrapnel, wiping out hundreds of Vijayanagara soldiers in minutes. As the Vijayanagara army was routed in chaos and the city was sacked soon after, it was clear that artillery had decisively crushed cavalry for the first time in South Asia. The age of gunpowder had dawned on the Deccan. The eventual victory of the Deccan Sultanate should show us that Indian polities can and did innovate in response to the world. We need to look beyond the limited perspective of North India and see what we can learn from the cosmopolitan sultans of the South. Very often in history, it pays off to ride the wave of global technological change and train local experts and in industries. In our own world, we can see plenty of examples of new superpowers whose arms and civilian industries have grown together as a result of investments in importing, localizing and then developing technology. And yet, examples of this from India's own past lie utterly ignored. If you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. For more videos that'll make you think, follow us on all of our social media handles. You can find me on Instagram at anirbuddha and at connectedhistories and on Twitter at akanisati. We'll see you next week.